I'm Jim Van Buskirk, Program Manager of the James C. Hormel Gay and Lesbian Center at the San Francisco Public Library. I'm here today with Daniel Nicoletta and a very select studio audience, and I've convinced Dan to preserve for posterity his presentation entitled Harvey Milk, A Personal View. Dan originally delivered the slide lecture on November 17, 1998, to an appreciative standing room only audience at the library's Corette Auditorium. The event was held in conjunction with Harvey Milk, Second Sight, an exhibit curated by Bob Kelly, which was on view at the San Francisco Art Commission Gallery during the fall of 1998. It included images made by Dan, as well as many from the Harvey Milk Archives Scott Smith collection. This important collection of materials associated with the life and legacy of Harvey Milk was donated to the library by Elva Smith, Scott Smith's mother, with the support and encouragement of a dedicated group of Harvey and Scott's friends, including Dan. The exhibit, the program, and the making available to researchers of this important collection are all aspects of the goals of the James C. Hormel Gay and Lesbian Center to preserve and make accessible the record of gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgender history. I'm not going to embarrass Dan today by listing all his credentials. I would just like to mention that his first retrospective exhibition in San Francisco in 1996 was sponsored by the Lesbian and Gay Employees Association of Levi Strauss and Company. On a personal note, I would just like to say how pleased and proud I am that about a dozen of Dan's photographs appeared in Gay by the Bay a history of queer culture in the San Francisco Bay Area. This is an, an acknowledgment of Dan's important contribution to documenting queer hit San Francisco over the last two dozen years. Welcome, Dan. Thank you, Jim. And thanks for including my work in Gay by the Bay. I'm very proud of that collaboration. <clears throat> uh, hi, I'm Dan Nicoletta, and it is an honor to be here sharing my friendship with Harvey Milk and Scott Smith. I had the pleasure of working in Harvey and Scott's Castro Street camera store in the heart of what we lovingly refer to as the gay ghetto. Um, I was 19 at the time. It was about 1975. <clears throat> I was a budding photographer, and I began to devote myself to documenting the emerging gay and lesbian and transgender and bisexual community. Um, Harvey and Scott became like gay parents to me. Uh, they took a, a genuine interest in my work, and both men were determined to deconstruct my last traces of self-doubt about being gay. Um, working there also provided me the opportunity to become politically active. I worked on three of Harvey's political campaigns, including the Victorious Campaign, when Harvey became the first elected gay official in California and one of the first in the nation. Um, after he served only 11 months in office, Harvey and then Mayor George Moscone were assassinated in their city hall offices by a homophobic colleague, Dan White. <clears throat> Throughout the years that followed, I continued to document the reverberations of Harvey's life. Um, it was my way of coping, and uh, I remained a close ally of Scott Smith, who uh, lovingly became known as the Widow Milk. Um, Scott and I and a bunch of Harvey's friends formed the fledgling organization called the Harvey Milk Archives, and uh, we cataloged and uh, disseminated Harvey's papers in an effort to continue his message of hope. I essentially stayed behind the camera during those years out of the spotlight. Um, Scott died in 1990, 1995, excuse me and um, sort of handed the torch of uh, the family archivist over to myself and that small group of people. And as Jim mentioned, together we um, worked with uh, Alva Smith, the executor of the Milk Estate and the Scott Smith Estate, and uh, transitioned the materials uh, to the San Francisco Public Library, the Hormel Gay and Lesbian Studies Center, uh, in, uh, c consistent with Scott's vision for the work. In 1997, I was asked to give a small slide talk um, as part of a summer-long festival in Berlin um, honoring the work of Magnus Hirschfeld, 
um, Hirschfeld uh, formed what could be considered the first gay community center ever. Uh, it was called the Institute of Sexual Science, and uh, the German government sponsored a summer-long event honoring the hundred years of the gay liberation movement. Um, the task of speaking about Harvey Milk, who and also his Jewish heritage in that context uh, fell into my lap and uh, was a little bit unnerving, actually. Um, <clears throat> but in the spirit of uh, what Harvey and Scott taught me, which was to find a personal voice and carry on the message of hope, I came out of my public speaking closet and uh, rose to the occasion. Um, and even though Berlin went very well, I, I remain timid about public speaking, uh, but my friends and colleagues in San Francisco uh, were eager to hear about my um, take on the Harvey Milk legacy. So uh, in conjunction with the 20-year mark of Harvey's assassination, I agreed to do the, the talk one more time publicly here at the San Francisco Public Library. and. Uh, I felt that Harvey and Scott would have wanted me to rise to that occasion. And um, even though the, uh, the talk went very well, um, it was in, you know, a standing room only auditorium and I received a, um, a standing ovation. Um, the proposal to tour the speech uh, that came after that was too daunting. <laughs> so this studio tape um, that you are about to experience is um, an attempt to uh, capture the material of the talk and uh, make uh, the material avail available to a wider audience. Um, we hope that it will augment a tour of um, the installation that uh, premiered back then, Harvey Milk's Second Sight. And, um, you know, this is not really a polished piece per se because uh, I would most likely resort to much quicker cuts and a much more polished script. So um, I hope you will um, be patient with the freeform anecdotes and the long holds on uh, the images and uh, let your mind treat them as meditative material. Um, incidentally, the images are not exclusively by me. Um, there's many sources and many other photographers involved, and including um, uh, unique, rarely seen images by Harvey Milk and Scott Smith. Um, my hope is that this will provide a unique personal view of uh, the men, Harvey Milk and Scott Smith, my friends. Harvey was 44 when we met, which is my age now. Um, he would be 68 years old today. This image is uh, a photograph that I took around 1977 for uh, his third supervisorial campaign, which is the campaign that he won. And this particular shot was actually uh, rejected because the tie was blowing in the wind, and we wanted the tie to be straight for the campaign literature. And um, after Harvey died, we were going through his material and found this strip of negatives. And upon reevaluation, I found the energy of it to be much nicer uh, with the tie blowing in the wind, and uh, it, it, the smile really exemplifies Harvey's nature. He was uh, a very jovial man, and uh, he had a wonderful, wonderful smile. <clears throat> Scott was 21 when he met Harvey on May 21st, 1971, which is Harvey's 41st birthday. Uh, Scott would be 49 years old today. On Scott's birthday, they went to the Pound in San Francisco and they got their first child, kid, and proceeded to tour California uh, in a beat-up old car, uh, driving up and down the coast uh, until their unemployment checks ran out. And then they came to San Francisco and uh, opened Castro Camera on Castro Street. I moved to Castro Street in 1974 um, in a little flat uh, just above 19th um, with my lover, then lover, whose name also was Harvey, and uh, another friend. And uh, the three of us shared uh, 
a flat which rented for $165, which by today's standard is unheard of. And we um, could barely afford the $55 each. That first week, I went down the street to uh, determine where I would be processing my movie film and my still film. I was uh, a film student at the time. And I walked into Castro Street Camera, and it was very surprising how wonderfully friendly these two guys were. And uh, I just couldn't get over how overtly friendly this one Harvey was. And uh, so I continued to go there and uh, started to not only take my film there, but started to hang out there. There was a, a gaggle of customers that enjoyed just sitting around and shooting the breeze. and. Uh, um, Harvey often hinted that I should never uh, have to worry about um, where my next roll of triax would come from, that we would work out some kind of trade or something. <laughs> um, although he never ex said exactly what we would trade, but I think we both uh, decided to remain uh, vague about that point. Um, and, uh, I was pretty clueless about cruising then, but within a couple months, I, I learned the, the ropes. And uh, one night coming home from after bar closing and uh, Castro Street was uh, lined up with guys looking for love, there was Harvey Milk. And uh, I swooped him up, and off we went to his apartment. So there you have it. Um, they were both artists. and. You know, they would do things like come, if I was involved in a theater production, they would come to the show and uh, they um, really cultivated uh, my sexual identity. They wanted to hear about my sexual exploits and uh, words cannot express how close and how dear the two men came, became in my life. These were exhilarating times. Uh, there was a general consensus that we had found Oz. And uh, my lover at the time had been gently urging me to come out of the closet. And it wasn't long before I uh, stepped out of the doorway of my halfway open closet and joined the kissing and hugging fest that characterized a typical stroll down Castro Street. Um, incidentally, if you're wondering what the uh, reference of the rainbow flag is it, it has something to do with uh, the Judy Garland song over the rainbow. The back porch of my apartment building was a veritable tales of the city. Um, there were six flats and uh, um, quite a few of them were gay communes. Um, we did have one little old, you know, that's sort of typical little old lady from the old guard of the neighborhood. And uh, then there were two straight girls who loved gay boys in one flat. And you know, we, um, on the weekends, the, the back doors were open, and it was like one big coffee clutch. Um, the top floor was a commune of gay guys from Ohio. And it seemed like every weekend, uh, a new group would arrive. And sometimes there was as many as six to eight guys sleeping in a two-bedroom flat. Uh, my lover and I broke up um, because we were both kind of forming our sexual identity out of the little strip of bars right there on Castle Street or south of Market. Uh, I was a regular at the stud. Um, I, stu I s mostly hung out at a place called Andy's Donuts, though, which was a 24-hour greasy sk spoon right there on Castro Street. and. Uh, this, it was there that I met a lot of the theater people that I would come to photograph and love, um, including uh, a 10-year stint uh, as the photographer for the uh, group called the Angels of Light, which um, was sort of the hippie drag aesthetic in its format. Um, w without reservations um, was what the restaurant turned into. Um, we were sort of dismayed by that, so we would just call it without. And now Andy's Donuts uh, up there on uh, 17th is sort of the bastard child of the original Andy's Donuts. Um, the, the guys would pour out of the bars at bar closing into Andy's Donuts, and sort of all the art fags would already be in there doing drawings and hanging out and drinking coffee all night. And so the place really rocked back then. 
Um, this was sort of a typical example of the kind of exciting things that were happening. This was um, a opening of, uh, the opening of a cafe also on Castro Street, which is now where the Patio Cafe is. And uh, Divine was in town opening a show, and Lily Tomlin happened to be at the party. And then two of the local queens there, Pristine Condition on the far right, who was one of the, the Cockettes, and Sister Ed, who was one of the Angels of Light. and. Uh, it was just a really wonderful day, and um, it sort of uh, represents one of my early forays into tranny chasing. I used to uh, follow pristine condition around like a little puppy dog trying to get the uh, definitive shot of this wonderful iconographic drag queen. Um, I was no fool. Prissy was always surrounded by cute art fags. Harvey and Scott. Um, Finally, after a year of being friends with them, uh, pulled me in off the street one day. I was walking down, and Harvey was standing in the doorway of the camera store. And he, in a very serious voice, he asked me, uh, could you come on in? I need to talk to you. And uh, he sat me down in the back, and he says, Scott and I would like you to come work for us. You know, I'm going to be entering my second supervisorial campaign, and uh, I'm going to need a extra pair of hands around here and uh, of course I, I accepted I, I had prior to that I had been doing everything from painting mushrooms on leather belts to uh, bike messenger to busboy and all that was fine because we were also thrilled to be in San Francisco but this this moment this job meant that my life would took flight would take flight uh, the store was amazing um, there I am uh, waiting on a customer. Um, this was a photograph taken by Harvey Milk of me. It was shot with infrared film, which is why I had that sort of milky white skin. Um, there was everything from little old ladies to the freelancers of the day. Uh, and uh, The place was very, very cruisy. Um, as you can see, the countertop is sort of at waist level. So the first thing we see when you walk in is your crotch. Um, and there certainly was a hierarchy of service. Uh, I, <laughs> Scott was exclusively to wait on the hunky leather queens. And Harvey got most of the little young twinks. And then I would get all the freaks. <laughs> uh, my first day of work at Castro Camera was the second annual street fair, which was kind of organized out of the store. The street merchants were um, getting the mapping for their the booths that they sell their art artworks in, and uh, the store was selling film, and they were registering voters out front, and uh, it was really crazy. And uh, unfortunately, I hadn't been trained yet, and I didn't know film prices, so there wasn't a lot I could do. So Harvey said, "Here, take these you know rolls of film." and go out and document the fair, and that's your first job for the day. And um, it was amazing. I immersed myself into that sea of people, and I, you know, I just had an amazing time photographing drag queens and theater people and hunky leather numbers. Um, so by now, I'm starting to kind of envision myself as the Diane Arbus of the gay community. and. Uh, uh, that night, we, um, well, we sent the film in for processing. And uh, in the next week, we would project the slides in the store window so passers-by could see the street fair. And um, that was possibly one of the first places I exhibited in town. <clears throat> um, it, the Castro Street Fair, as well as the Gay Freedom Day Parade, were like a photographer's dream world come true. Um, people's exhibitionism spilled out into the streets, and the excitement in the air was tangible. We all had a real strong sense of manifest destiny, especially among us photographers and filmmakers. Um, we networked, we shared resources, we did exhibits together. Um, this is where I first met people like Rink, who's still, you know, very much um, part of the community's uh, documentation world and. Uh, Crawford Barton, who was uh, a staff photographer for The Advocate, 
Uh, there was Guy Corey who ran a, a, a funky little portrait studio on Castro Street, and uh, the list goes on. Um, this was uh, two of the guys from Ohio that were sort of early radical fairies. Um, that's Harmodius on your left and uh, Hotai on your right. They're in front of uh, an apartment door also on Castro Street. Um, and behind that blue door was an amazing commune. Uh, it was populated by people who were with the Angels of Light. And they would throw parties and show films up there. Uh, Mark Hustis, uh, the, the noted uh, filmmaker, uh, started the Gay Film Festival there. Um, Tattoo Mike lived there. Teddy Matthews, who was an early spokesperson for um, transgender issues, lived there. And uh, Stephen Brown, who was a romantic partner of mine, uh, played with the band Tuxedo Moon. And uh, I just have such fond memories of uh, parties in that, that particular apartment. Um, this is the street fair again, and these guys were part of Sylvester's entourage. Sylvester was a uh, disco singer who was sort of uh, rising to fame and uh, was sort of uh, a local treasure because he was out openly gay. And um, <clears throat> the guy in the middle's name is December. He, I didn't know him when I took this picture, but he became a very dear friend of mine over the years because we were both born on December 23rd. And uh, this is one of the, the joys of photography for me, is photographing somebody and um, not knowing them very well or not knowing them at all. And then uh, over time, you know, getting to know them through the process of photography. It's, it's pretty amazing. Harvey and Scott always used to kid me that I would come back from the street fairs with uh, pictures, only pictures of drag queens and theater people, and all my buddies were photographing hunky numbers. Um, but this, this picture disproves that theory. Um, this was a conceptual art piece by a guy named Violet Ray, who walked around all day with that placard of a uh, suntan billboard. And people would un uh, undo themselves <laughs> in front of it or a camp and mug. Um, Violet Ray was part of a neat collective of people that were some of the early people I exhibited with. They were called the Hula Palace, and uh, they were pretty great because they used to astrologically forecast when uh, would be a good time to do a salon, and they would empty their furniture out of their house for a three-day period uh, based on the stars. And then they would have three days of artwork and um, uh, performance art. And that was also right there at 19th and Castro. I became obsessed with that, that theater world, the, the Angels of Light. And the, they were descended from a group called the Coquettes, which was the original sort of genderfuck theater group that triumphed in San Francisco from about 1969 to 1972, which was before my time. Um, I arrived in 74. But I, I sought these people out. Sylvester was one of them. Reggie, who you see here, was one of them. And I followed them around, like I said earlier, like a little puppy dog, and uh, you know, photographed some of the plays that they continued to do under, under different guises. And uh, this really was the, the main common ground between Harvey and I, because he had uh, experience off-Broadway in New York, and he loved regaling me with tales of what the theater world was like back then, and, and I loved listening to his stories. I'm going to transition to a photograph that was taken by Harvey, and it's a very similar kind of aesthetic. This was probably a post Coquette's show circa 1973, and I, it really demonstrates how um, well, one, that there was this idyllic period where Harvey and Scott um, had not really entered the political arena, and so they were enjoying the fruits of this magical, wonderful city and going to things like shows and, you know, not really um, focused on a political uh, vision. And um, here's, uh, here's another shot from that same collection in Harvey's albums, and that's Sylvester on stage. Um, 
Okay, so I'm going to use this as a way of um, identifying uh, an idyllic period versus a period when uh, it became all politics. So let's backtrack a little bit to Harvey's early years. He was born in 1930 in Woodmere, New York. Um, he was born uh, into a family of immigrant Russian Jews. Um, it, we're not quite sure whether Harvey was uh, born with the uh, opera gene or whether he acquired it. Uh, mm -hmm. But um, it, it's been documented that he, as a young lad, he found out early that uh, the standing room section of the opera at the Metropolitan uh, Opera House in New York was a place that he could find sex and did. And that led him to discovering the, uh, the, the bushes in Central Park. And uh, at age 17, he's nearly busted by the New York City Police Department for cruising Central Park. And he was uh, reported to being um, un unnerved by the fact that straight men were allowed to roam around Central Park without a shirt, but, he, uh, but gay men were constantly harassed. So this is probably a really pivotal point for him in terms of understanding socially um, how gays were mistreated and excluded. Um, Harvey graduated from Albany State Teachers College and shortly after joined the military. Um, he was a genuine patriot, but it would be safe to assume that uh, the same-sex camaraderie of the military informed Harvey's patriotism. <laughs> Here he is. Uh, with two of his friends in boot camp. And uh, you can see that there's a sense of slapstick already in place. Harvey was discharged to Los Angeles in 1955. And uh, uh, the, you know, I love this photograph. It sort of uh, is an indicator of the post-service camaraderie that spilled out into the beaches and the bars and the gyms of LA. Uh, Harvey met at that time and fell in love with a guy named John Harvey. And they both know a photographer named Bob Miser who ran what was called the LA Athletics Models Guild. Uh, and uh, John Harvey is still alive and he lives in the Castro. And he was conveying to me that this photo of him was very uh, brave at the time that uh, it was considered a pornography of its day, and he was petrified that his parents would find out that he did it. Um, Bob Miser, incidentally, is a very strong influence on me um, because it, it was uh, the homoeroticism of its time, but it was both subversive and theatrical. And uh, it sort of uh, gives, gives the little secret that there was a um, sort of uh, secret society of gay men. I mean, we would trade these pictures like um, baseball cards. And uh, there's sort of a, an, an innate wink within the, the, the frame, framework of the photographs. Um, you know, they're supposed to be uh, athletic photos, but we know better. Harvey uh, then moved back to New York. And he met a gentleman named Joe Campbell. And uh, this is both of them at Reese Park, which was uh, a place that they went a lot. And uh, there was a gay beach at Reese Park. And they lived in a traditional marriage from about 1956 to 1962. And uh, Harvey would often tell me tales of, of Joe in those years, because Joe was uh, <clears throat> a regular at the um, Andy Warhol factory. and, and uh, starred in Andy's film, My Hustler, and is also sung about in the Lou Reed song, Walk on the Wild Side. Um, his name was Sugar Plum Fairy. And uh, I just loved those stories because um, I can remember when I was a young kid, I, I watched the Warhol Superstars on late night TV talk show one night. And I determined right then and there that that's what I was going to be when I grew up. <laughs> Um, we're not sure who this is with Harvey, but I think it's kind of um, 
a good indicator of Harvey's uh, conservatism breaking down. This is the 60s, and uh, you know he uh, was relatively closeted because he was a Wall Street broker. Um, but at about this time, he meets a couple really important people. He meets Craig Rodwell, who is uh, early founder of the Mattachine Society, a gay liberation uh, organization in New York, and uh, Galen McKinley, who becomes his romantic partner after Rodwell, and Tom O'Horgan, the fledgling um, off-Broadway director. And this is um, Craig Rodwell at Reese Park also. And um, Harvey's romance with Craig was short, but um, I think it's really a, a very critical relationship because Rodwell was uh, basically part of the militant uh, division of the Mattachine Society. And uh, for example, at Reese Park, um, there was uh, again a disparity between the way the cops treated gays and the way the cops treated straight men and gays were not allowed to go up on the boardwalk without a shirt on, although straight men were allowed to go up there shirtless. And any time a gay person went up there shirtless, they were immediately arrested and thrown into jail. And uh, Craig defied that um, several times and got thrown, brutalized and thrown into jail several times. And uh, it's documented that he often argued with Harvey about the need to come out and the need to um, be more strident, and uh, Harvey was fearful of losing his job as a Wall Street broker. And um, you know, eventually they parted the ways. Uh, Craig later opened uh, the first gay bookstore in New York, and um, it, you just have to think that this is this is probably a really important turning point. This is a really important person in Harvey's life. Um, with his next romantic partner, Galen McKinley, who was a close ally of uh, the fledgling director, Tom O'Horgan, the three became inseparable friends. And uh, there's a lot of photographic material uh, showing them you know, tripping around New York together. Um, Harvey even acted in some of the early productions at La Mama Theater, which uh, is another area that um, I just adored hearing stories about. Harvey told me that he um, would uh, often buy hamburgers for Tom because he worked and Tom was really poor. He even had holes in his shoes uh, in the winter time. And uh, he also told me about a story where Ellen Stewart, uh, who is La Mama, who, who basically started La Mama Theater, um, wanted to go to a big uh, elegant cocktail party in order to secure a grant and so she snuck in the maid's entrance in a maid's costume with her gown in a paper bag and then when she got inside she switched into her gown and uh, and up she went and she got her grant. Mm -hmm. um, anyway the the hamburgers kind of paid off because Tom eventually came to direct hair on Broadway and then later the other mega hits Jesus Christ Superstar and uh, the friendship with Harvey um, carried over into those years, and uh, Harvey actually went on tour with the, the road company of Hare. And so again, you see something that happened a long time ago, but it it's definitely has uh, a strong effect on his identity and his political vision. Uh, after they traveled to California, which, you know, the pictures convey this amazing journey, you know, with the cast of hair and all these really extraordinarily gorgeous hippie boys and and, and stunning women and uh, they came back to New York and Tom produced his next two plays that um, were not that well received but I think they're pretty important plays. One is called Inner City Mother, Mother Goose based on the Eve Merriam book uh, Inner City Mother Goose which is an amazing wonderful book um, and uh, and then the second play was called Lenny, which was based on the story of Lenny Bruce, who was uh, a uh, circuit comedian, sort of a burlesque uh, comedian who was a champion of censorship issues, who was constantly persecuted by the police. And uh, um, 
this play was, um, you know, basically a biographical piece about him. And I think, you know, considering Harvey's life, you have to, you just have to guess that Lenny was a tremendous influence on Harvey. Um, uh, during this period, uh, Scott met, uh, I'm sorry, during this period, Harvey met Scott Smith uh, at the Christopher Street subway stop. And uh, even though this picture was taken after uh, that point um, by Harvey, it, I think it really evokes what that first moment must have been like. And uh, there's Scott in his tight little bell bottoms. And um, they became really uh, close romantic partners. And I, uh, now I want to read a letter um, from uh, Harvey to Scott. And it just gives you a really good sense of when Harvey was courting somebody, he was really extraordinarily passionate about it. He had gone back to California uh, to live permanently and was waiting for Scott to finish up his duties as stage manager for uh, Inner City and then uh, come back, come to him in California. He writes, Dear Scott, this is circa 1972. It's Sunday afternoon, sunny, grand, and I'm alone in the apartment playing one of my favorite operas, De Rose and Cavalier by Strauss. To me, the music is some of the most beautiful ever written, and I feel like an amyl nitrate high throughout. It's so romantically exciting. I feel so good, so excited, so happy in just writing to you. I feel young and light, and I guess I just feel in love. I wish all the haters of the world, all the Nixons of this world, all the shits of the world could feel that warmth, that excitement, that nervousness that fills me at this moment. It's just that I consider myself lucky to be able to experience love, even at a distance and over a long, long time apart. I am still lucky, very lucky. I miss you so fucking much. Should I stay here or return to New York? Maybe I was crazy to leave, but I was going crazy staying. I guessed I was boxed in and I had to lose. I'm just saddened that I had to lose you somewhere along the line. If someone would only push me, if someone would tell me for once, fuck, that's my Gemini and planets in Gemini, Gemini that keeps me crazy. I just love that astrological reference. <laughs> So, um, well, did I go, I went too far there. Okay, sorry about that. Um, so Harvey moves to California and he becomes pals with uh, his former roommate in California, Tom Muir, who's a puppeteer, and his lover, Denton Smith. And uh, these guys form the foundation of Harvey's California family, theatrical family. Um, there's a wonderful series of photographs where uh, that repertoire of people go out to the ocean to do a fashion spread. And uh, there's primarily these photographs of these really very beautiful hippie boys in all these really wonderful costumes. And then smack in the middle of this one proof sheet is one frame of Harvey standing there wearing one of the costumes. So this is Harvey's uh, fashion modeling career in its entirety. Uh, this is kind of a crossroads photo for me. This is back at the camera store, and uh, finally, um, after hearing so many stories about him, Tom's old pal, uh, Harvey's old pal, Tom O'Horgan, came to California to visit, and I finally got to meet him, and he was wonderful. And then immediately to Harvey's right is Frank Robinson, Harvey's new dear close friend, uh, who was a, a novelist uh, that lived in the Castro, who was as much a regular at the camera store as I. And uh, Frank uh, began to help Harvey draft his speeches and uh, was one of the, the uh, brains behind many of the speeches that we know and love today. This is backing up just a little bit, and it's, uh, it's probably the camera store right when they first opened in uh, March of 1973. Uh, Scott is sitting there on a little upside-down upside bucket, um, and they've 
uh, immediately started exhibiting work on the walls. So uh, their love of um, art and artists and uh, you know, the desire to turn the store into a place of uh, you know, community forum was, was right from the beginning. It eventually turned into a kind of Pee Wee's Playhouse that you see here. Um, and uh, people helped them build furniture and uh, it was a very colorful place. Harvey was angered by the Watergate hearings that he was watching on television every day, and uh, he decided to run for office for the first time. Um, he also started writing a column for BAR, the gay weekly paper at that time. And it's here that you see the first foundation emerging of his political vision. Um, I'm going to read a campaign ad that, that gives a clue to uh, the driving idea behind Harvey's political vision. It goes, let my tax money go for my protection and not my prosecution. Protect my home, protect my streets, protect my life, protect my property. Let my minister and not some policeman worry about morality. Let the supervisors worry about child care centers and not what books I want to read. Let the supervisors worry about becoming human beings and not how to prevent others from enjoying their lives. Around uh, that same time, uh, Labor Day in 1974, Harvey had lost that first supervisorial campaign, but he gained a lot of leverage as sort of the unofficial mayor of Castro Street. And uh, one last time, the cops came into the Castro and arrested 14 guys for loitering uh, during the, the, the bar hours on the weekend. And, um, the, because of the clout that was sort of fomenting in the neighborhood, a series of police community relations meetings uh, began in the Collingwood Rec Center, which is uh, in that neighborhood. And uh, this is right about when I moved to the Castro, and I had just met Harvey and Scott, and I went over to the Collingwood Recreation Center to take part in these hearings. And um, I was sort of uh, jostled by seeing these sort of uh, sweet and gentle guys that I had just met, Harvey and Scott, were in a room packed full of facts that were just yelling at the top of their lungs and demanding that the police stop this kind of treat, uh, sort of irrational treatment. And that was, in fact, the last series of arrests for, um, for lawyering in the Castro. This is uh, one of my favorite photos of the camera store by um, my dear friend Guy Corey. And uh, it's just a sort of serene moment of two guys uh, who have just picked up their proof sheet and they're sitting out front looking at their pictures. Um, it reminds me of a little story uh, that sort of um, tells a little bit about the camera store. Uh, people would often come there because they had heard that uh, we would develop um, explicit photographs and uh, so people would come timidly walking in and they'd say well do you develop nudes and we'd say yeah you know and then they'd say well do you develop such and such and we'd say yeah we develop just about anything um, and uh, before long you know they were dropping off their film and then they were telling us that we could uh, look at their pictures and that would be a little clue to us that we needed to put a, a special fly stamp on the envelope to remember to look at their pictures when they come back. <laughs> uh, the guys, Harvey and Scott, really uh, relished reading the, the daily paper every morning until the campaign really uh, geared up. That was something that they always looked forward to. And there was the additional ritual of cutting out a comic strip or two to share with various friends that came by. Here's Harvey uh, sharing the daily comic strip with Denton. Uh, they were also big fans of Saturday Night Live, so a lot of the dialogue was uh, around what occurred on Saturday Night Live. Um, you know, a sense of humor was really important in the camera store. Harvey used to say that if you can't laugh, you're kind of missing the point, and uh, that's certainly came in handy as the campaign geared up and uh, there became less and less time for recreation. 
Um, this was Scott's birthday, and we started the tradition of throwing pies in each other's face. And he got two pies that day, and he was not happy. <laughs> but the tradition carried on for several years, actually. And uh, I got two pies on my birthday. And uh, I can remember going in that day to work, and uh, the both, both guys were sitting there with really big sheepish grins on their face. And uh, so I knew I was going to get pied, but I just didn't know when. And a little while passed, and I go to the proof sheet area to give a customer their order. And there, sitting on top of the proof sheets, is a, a cream pie. And so I close the drawer and go on with my business. And a little while later, I go to uh, the slide area, and there, sitting on top of the slides, is another cream pie. And uh, before the end of the day, I got nailed with both. <laughs> Harvey, we threw Harvey into a giant cream pie one year, too. Um, we had a really eclectic group of customers uh, that came in. This is a photograph by one of my favorite customers, who was a hippie mom, who would often come in with her son, Dean. And that's Harvey with Dean and me holding a toy gun, holding Dean's toy, toy gun up to Harvey's head. It's sort of an uncanny premonitional photo, art imitating life. It's also one of the few photographs of Harvey and I together. Um, this is one of the best examples of um, Harvey's merging of theater and politics. Um, I'm somewhere in that lineup. Um, the, uh, this is the second supervisorial campaign, and we had very little money, so instead of buying billboards, we created human billboards, and we would greet uh, the morning commuter traffic, and it was sort of nice to see people transformed. They'd see us, and they'd, you know, their face would change from dour expressions to broad smiles, and uh, this tradition is still, to this day, is carried on by um, uh, grassroots political campaigns that can't afford billboard space. Um, this is Harvey and the union leader, Alan Baird. And this was an unprecedented, alli unprecedented alliance. Uh, Alan came to Harvey and asked him to rally the gay bar support of a Coors beer boycott. And um, through his column in BAR, Harvey eventually got most of the gay bars to join in the boycott, which brought um, the Coers, a uh, really sort of uh, bigoted right-wing family, to their knees because they dropped down from the number one position in California. Um, they eventually flew Alan Beard out to their headquarters in Colorado uh, to the negotiating table. And um, Alan came back reporting that Joe Coers was um, just could not fathom that there was such a thing as the uh, as a gay community. Uh, the assembly race, which immediately followed the second supervisorial race, which he lost, um, even though it was a more well-financed campaign, um, it was primarily run on ingenuity, uh, good, good PR. Harvey was by this time learned how to play the media like a harp, um, and also a good sense of humor. Um, we got our own printing press in the back of the store, and uh, this was one of the handmade billboards that uh, were also made there in the back of the store. This is um, John Reichman, who was the, the uh, campaign manager and fundraiser for uh, the campaign. He He's on the phone uh, trying to shake down donations. This is actually Harvey's uh, private office. It's sort of the inner sanctum. Uh, I thought you'd like to see it. Um, over the door is a little sign that says, fortunes told, 25 cents, 50 cents with lipstick, um, <laughs> appointments only. Uh, this is probably, the, in my guess, this would be the place where Harvey taped his political will where he left instructions in the event of uh, his assassination. Um, it was right about this time that we started to get a lot of hate mail. And uh, I can remember this pretty distinctly because Harvey uh, pulled me aside one day and said, you know, this stuff that we're getting is really heinous, and uh, you might be caught in the line of fire. 
and uh, maybe you should take some time off. And uh, I was not interested in doing that. Harvey forged alliances with a lot of different communities. This is Mike Wong, who was a strong ally of the Chinese uh, democratic community. Um, and uh, he came over to Harvey's campaign after being uh, very closely associated with uh, a lot of the progressive uh, Democrats. And uh, he supported Harvey, as many people did, because they were tired of business as usual. There was a lot of uh, backroom politics and within the Democratic uh, Party, and uh, the Harvey represented um, adversity to that. He wanted a whole piece of the pie instead of a little bit of crumbs that they were offering. Uh, Michael was sort of surprised to come to the camera store and find such an eclectic group of people uh, that he he fit in right away, especially after um, the introductory moment when. Um, he said to Harvey, God, this place is a pigsty. You know, there's dust everywhere. Is this how your people live? And Harvey retorted, no, Michael, we've just been waiting for our Chinese houseboy. Now there's the broom. <laughs> and that kind of repertoire, repartee went on throughout the whole uh, campaign. There was a, uh, an 11 year old girl who came to. Uh, canvas for, pa, uh, for Harvey. Her name was Medora Payne, and she would often bring her little friend Lizzie Croyle, and they would come and stuff envelopes. And uh, when she first showed up, uh, John Reichman called her mom and said, your daughter's filled out a volunteer card, and you know, are you aware that she's uh, planning to uh, come volunteer for Harvey? And his, her mom said, oh yeah, she loves Harvey, and she wants to do something for him. This is Medora and her mom, Gretchen, out in front of the camera store with Harvey mugging as per usual behind them. Um, you know, he was really great at forging alliances. Uh, this was, uh, we went down to the uh, piers in San Francisco to stage uh, uh, a campaign photo with two of our butcher um, campaign workers, and while we were there, two real lo longshoremen uh, came up and um, stood there and talked with Harvey for oh, over 45 minutes. And uh, you know, this is one of the things that I really loved seeing, uh, how he was um, really gifted at getting people to open up. And um, it's certainly something that I carried over to my photography. Um, one of my favorite places to go with Harvey for on the campaign trail was uh, the bingo games, and uh, you know this was in the heart of the mission, and these people were sort of blasé because politicians would often court them and hand out literature uh, during the bingo games, and uh, the um, it was sort of allowed because the politicians would go up and and. Um, offer a, a monetary donation and up the ante a little bit. And, uh, you know, I could very clearly see that when Harvey went up on stage to offer his 20 bucks, people really, uh, you know, the body language was um, responsive. And, and then when he and I would work the crowd and hand out the literature, people actually did want to accept it, accept the piece of literature. And that, you know, those bingo game, those bingo players there, there, you know, um, the the um, the political alliances um, were just in the nick of time. Um, enter the Wicked Witch of the East, Anita Bryant. Um, she uh, was a former Miss America and a star wannabe, who launched an elaborate mail order campaign uh, and succeeded in repealing a gay rights referendum in Florida. Um, she targeted SF constantly and called us a cesspool of sex. Uh, we responded in kind in our 1977 parade uh, with placards uh, drawing analogies between her and what she was doing to some of the more notorious fascists throughout history. On the left is Hitler and then Stalin and then Anita Bryant and then the Ku Klux Klan 
and then Idi Amin, who was uh, an African leader at the time who was murdering thousands in his own country and, and uh, executing anybody who was homosexual. During the media furor over Anita Bryant, um, a gay man was murdered in San Francisco, and his assailants stabbed him repeatedly and called him fag. Um, and, uh, and everybody felt that Anita Bryant had blood on her hands and that this sort of backlash was occurring because of the high profile over these gay rights referendums that she was uh, defeating. Uh, Florida and several other American cities were lost uh, during this time. Um, her campaign was called Save Our Children, and we responded in kind by saying, we are your children. Um, the analogy to Hitler kept on emerging. Harvey certainly uh, found it uh, pertinent and useful. And uh, it's about this time that you start to see the pink triangle emerge as an icon. Uh, right there in the middle of those flowers uh, that was a spontaneous memorial to um, uh, this slain gay man uh, is a pink triangle. Uh, this is the 1977 Castro Street Fair, and here's Harvey in uh, a dunking tank, dunking tank booth. Uh, it says, Dunk a Fellow for Freedom, and that's Anita Bryant's face on the, uh, the mechanism that makes him go into the water. Um, this was a fundraiser for uh, the um, newly formed uh, gay democratic club called Gay Vote at that time. And, and after Harvey was killed, it, it became uh, the Harvey Milk Democratic Club because he, was, uh, he helped form it. Um, the, because of Anita Bryant's presence, it, it, it was a time in our community's history where we really understood to be embattled and at war. Here's uh, Harvey's lover at the time, Jack Lira, taking sadistic pleasure in uh, getting Harvey wet. Um, so Harvey is running for supervisor for the third time. Uh, this time, uh, the mood is giddy because uh, even though there was still a lot of uncertainty, it looked really good. Uh, there's a precinct map behind him. Uh, district elections had recently passed, and so this was uh, elections by district, and Harvey was smack in the middle of the heavily gay uh, voting district. Um, this is uh, Dick Pavich on the left and Ann Cronenberg in the middle and Jim Rivaldo uh, on the right, and these were very important strategists in Harvey's um, volunteer crew. Uh, Dick uh, and Ann were named Harvey's administrative assistants uh, after he, he won, and Jim is today is one of the uh, more brilliant political strategists in town, if you can believe that. There he is, being goofy as usual. Um, this is the night of the election victory and uh, you know uh, we're listening to the returns we're at the camera store and, and we're listening to the returns on the radio there on KPFA and uh, they just announced Harvey's lead um, that's Harry Britt um, on the far left kind of clenching his fists in a, a vic victorious gesture um, that's Wayne Friday Harvey's very good friend and close political ally just below him and then that's Bill Krause leaning up against the radio there. Uh, Bill would move on to become a very important political strategist as well uh, as Phil Burton's administrative assistant. Um, Harvey arrived from City Hall uh, to uh, a victorious crowd out in front of the camera store. Uh, he came on uh, Joyce Garay's motorcycle. Joyce was Ann Cronenberg's lever at the time. They were two of the uh, very early dykes on bikes. And Harvey jumped off the motorcycle and ran with outstretched arms towards the, uh, the crowd, which was ecstatic. And uh, he, uh, he stopped and, and made a small speech. And people were just incredibly jubilant. Uh, I'd have to say it was probably one of the best nights of my life. 
um, in January uh, was the inauguration, and uh, Harvey and Carol Ruth Silver, who also had uh, won for supervisor, decided to have a, an inaugural ceremony on the steps of City Hall. Uh, and so they marched from the Castro to City Hall by their constituents, with their constituents following them, and then assembled on the steps of City Hall uh, so that there can be a more accessible inauguration ceremony because everybody couldn't fit into the board chambers inside. And during um, the ceremony, it started to sprinkle, and Harvey looked straight at the media cameras and, and used it as a, an opportunity to uh, um, symbolically uh, discuss uh, gay politics. He said, you know, Anita Bryant says that the uh, gays in California are the reason for the, the drought, and here I'm uh, being inaugurated as the first openly gay elected official <coughs> in California, and uh, this is this is my this must be God's response to you, Anita Anita Bryant. Um, that next few months were fantastic. I mean, there was a lot of events, and uh, I was at this particular event photographing and. Uh, I remember it clearly because the, uh, the applause was so thunderous that it felt like the building was shaking. And uh, this was uh, the coronation of the San Francisco Emperor and Empress, which is a sort of big drag ball that's, that's held in town every year. And uh, here's Harvey Milk and Mayor George Moscone and Supervisor Carol Ruth Silver. Um, and uh, the, uh, the crowd would just went wild because uh, these, you know, that these people were there um, expressing their gratitude and, uh, um, you know, sort of acknowledging that their constituents was really well appreciated. And uh, the mayor actually went up to uh, the empress and put a little peck, you know, give her a little kiss on the side of the cheek, which I know, you know, Harvey took great delight in that. And it was these kind of small victories towards visibility which really fueled his joy of politics, you know, he, he considered that kind of gesture, you know, the, may, the mayor of a major uh, American city um, paying his respects to uh, the transgender community like that, a, a really significant gesture. Harvey um, was uh, always, you know, using the media to, to uh, further his, his cause. and. Uh, here he was mayor for a day. Uh, George had left town and, and asked Harvey to be acting mayor for a day. And so we staged uh, the opening of uh, a friend of ours restaurant. And um, Harvey cut the ribbon on the restaurant and, and was quoted in the media as saying, I'm probably the only mayor of a major American city who cuts the ribbon and then puts it in his hair. <laughs> Um, we, we all went over to the mayor's office that day, and um, as people walked through the front door, Harvey would mock like he was signing a, an official piece of paper, and he'd say things like, well, Mr. Nicoletta, what, what appointment was that that you wanted? And um, he actually also made a special offer to me, which had something to do with the mayor's desk, but um, I respectfully declined. <laughs> um, the guys were pretty funny. I mean, it was like the Marx Brothers had, had hit the mayor's office. They were completely enamored with the mayor's shredding machine. <laughs> Harvey was fond of calling City Hall Silly Hall, but he, you know, he really took it uh, deeply seriously as well. I mean, this was his shining moment. Um, this was the signing into law by Mayor George Moscone, uh, the gay rights uh, protection ordinance on the city level that Harvey had authored, and George went along with the fun and signed it in a lavender pen. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Harvey was often heard saying, I'm the head queen in town now, and um, the, here he is at another drag function with two really important people. That's Jose Saria on the left and um, Mavis on the right. And Jose was uh, one of the founding mothers of the Empress uh, and Emperor coronation. 
um, and he was one of the first men, openly gay men, to run for city office back in the late 60s, and Mavis was a bar owner. And um, they were presenting a check to the um, gay and lesbian marching band uh, that was a check from an anonymous donor who had uh, uh, donated money so that the marching band can find, uh, buy their first uniforms. And Harvey just thought that was great, that there was a gay marching band. And um, I'm, I want to utilize uh, this to illustrate a really important story. And um, the story tells us uh, a little bit about a, a community informant under pressure and how different people uh, respond. Now, you know, it was clear that Harvey uh, respected his drag roots, but because of um, another anti-gay initiative that was on the horizon, um, there was a, um, a sort of uh, word, the word had gone out from various sectors of the community that um, perhaps in this forthcoming parade, uh, we should tone down our act and that, um, it, you know, that people should be mindful of, of lewdness and nudity. And um, Harvey uh, was part of that voice of asking people to um, tone down their act. His recommendation was that we carry signs saying what cities we were from or what professions we had and to basically um, modify our uh, appearance. And of course, the voice from the streets was swift, and uh, the people who could not pass found that kind of offensive. Um, this was a, a mock campaign uh, running against Harvey Milk by a drag queen named Silvana Nova, and uh, she was mocking Harvey's earlier campaign where he said, uh, Milk has something to vote for. Milk has something to uh, offer, and uh, so Silvana's here saying some at last something to vote for. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was another great flyer that was um, mocking official parade drag. And um, I, just, I just think it, it shows that, um, you know we, know, we now know, you know, 20 years later that um, no matter what we do, uh, the, the right wing is going to take uh, footage of our lives and manipulated into propaganda and that it really is uh, misplaced judgment to modify for their sake who and how we are. And uh, this was one area where Harvey and I um, differed um, philosophically. In fact, we argued about it and I can remember sitting in Castro Camera with him and the filmmaker Mark Hustis and, and uh, him and Mark were going at it passionately, passionately, and and Mark was accusing Harvey of being patronizing, which he was, and and uh, I took one look at the situation and I said, "You cannot win an argument with this man." So I just kind of receded into the background on that. Um, on uh, the day before. His 47th birthday, Harvey was invited to promote the Ringling Brothers Circus, um, and he got to be a clown for a day. He was a natural. Um, he uh, was. It was. This was an article to uh, encourage people to attend the circus, and so Harvey and six other San Francisco celebrities were invited to um, dress up like clowns, and they were documented. Um, and Harvey enjoyed the experience so much, and uh, he asked the clowns if he could borrow the costume for uh, a Fort Funston fundraiser uh, that he had to attend later in the day, and they said, sure, and uh, just return it to our hotel room afterwards. And so he and I drove down to the ocean where this fundraiser was, and he was kind of clowning people the whole way there. And when we got there um, after the fundraiser, he and I went out to the shore uh, to go cruise the hang gliders, and uh, we did this little mini photo session. And uh, this is, I feel this is like Harvey's farewell portrait to me because this is the one photo of Harvey Milk that I would take that nobody else would ever take. And I think it forever symbolizes our artistic friendship. Um, I want to read a, a letter 
that he had wrote to Castro Camera customers, and it's probably the only textual reference to our friendship. And uh, I just, this letter is my pride and joy, so I, I'd like to share it with you. It says, yes, dear Castro Camera customers, come on now. You knew you would be getting this letter sooner or later. As you well know, I'm running for the position of your supervisor because of all the time, energy, and funds that we have uh, at the shop have been putting into the campaign. The shop has been crazy. Our inventory is low. Our nerves are, shall we say, thin. In short, it doesn't look like Castro Camera, or maybe it does. As a candidate, I make no promise. As a part owner of the shop, I make one promise. After the election, my partner Scott and our number one employee, Danny, and myself will bring the shop back to where it should be. It will take some time and energy, so give us a few weeks, but it will happen. In the meantime, thank you for continuing to support our shop. Thank you for understanding. Thank you for asking us to continue in the battles. I want to say to you that without the help of my partner Scott and our number one employee, Danny, who over the years has become a great friend too, I would have not been able to get so involved with the issues that affect us, all of us. To them, I owe a bit more than just that, just a thanks. To them, I owe more than words can ever say, warmly, Harvey. Um, I actually stopped working at Castro Camera after Harvey was elected, although I would occasionally go in there to moonlight, and so I did have the opportunity to uh, befriend Harvey's lover, Jack Lira, um, and both of us saw less and less of Harvey, uh, and uh, we kind of consoled each other. Jack very, felt very much uh, like the politician's wife in the shadow of this person that everybody wanted a little piece of. Um, everybody was kind of concerned because Jack's way of coping it was to go into uh, rage and um, sort of pull public stunts, uh, uh, quite often drinking and uh, embarrassing Harvey. And uh, everybody was really concerned about this relationship, but it, um, Harvey was pretty committed to it. and. Uh, he was really troubled by Jack's behavior, but he, he really wanted to um, help this guy. And uh, unfortunately, one night, Harvey came home from a board meeting and found Jack uh, had committed suicide uh, and hung himself over their bed. Uh, he had done things like he had strewn Coors beer cans all throughout the apartment and left little cryptic notes. Um, and, it, you know, we were just, you know, completely derailed by this. Um, but in, in Jack's um, defense, I want to read a letter that Harvey wrote to him, which I think portrays um, how much Harvey really deeply loved him. He wrote on January 24th, 1977, Jack, watching the ocean slam against the rock, spraying its mists, the sun setting in the background, and you digging for your joys, I could not help myself stop from looking into your wondrous face. And last night as I carried you to your bed, I saw the day over and over and over. I needed no camera yesterday to capture the glorious pictures. They are forever burnt into my heart, Harvey. And after we came to Harvey's side to console him, he wrote those of us that showed up a little note, and I think this is a really important uh, piece of writing by Harvey because it's one of the few places he talks about spiritual matters um, in a way differently than the larger w world view of politics. He says, one day shortly after I went down to the ocean, I saw a glorious sunset. It died into the evening, but I knew it would be reborn the next morning with equal splendor, and I understood. So as we know, on Monday, November 27th, Dan White snuck into City Hall through uh, a back window and murdered Harvey Milk and Mayor George Moscone. In Harvey's pocket were two letters and um, one was to George to thank him for the opera tickets from the previous night's performance. I'd like to read the, the Moscone letter 
um, because it just demonstrates how Harvey was in, in the prime of his life and was really enjoying life. Um, <clears throat> ironically, the, uh, the bullet went right through the M in the word music. It says, George, thanks for the opera seats. If there's any chance for Saturday Symphony, my true love of music is showing itself. Now, the opera seats that he was talking about were a couple nights prior. He got to sit in the box with his childhood opera idol, uh, Bidu Sayu, and uh, he was so excited about the experience, he came home that night and wrote a letter to Tom O'Horgan, his dear friend uh, in New York, and he writes, Tom, sitting in a box next to and talking with Bidu Sayu and listening to Magda Olivier in her SF debut at age 71, the crowd went so wild that Mick Jagger would have been jealous. I can't remember any reaction like that. And Sayo was like a youngster hearing her first live opera. Ah, life is worth living. Love, Harvey. And Tom uh, didn't receive the letter until after hearing of Harvey's murder. I, uh, the night of the, uh, the night before the killings, uh, while Dan White was sitting in his apartment, sort of watching television and, and eating junk food. I was in the wings photographing the ballet Trocadero. And um, when we were coming back to town the next day, uh, my colleagues and I uh, disembarked off the bus. And I heard this bus driver say, uh, did you hear, this is him speaking to another bus driver. He said, did you hear that Harvey Milk and George Moscone were killed? And then he said, and that Harvey Milk's no loss. And I couldn't believe what I was hearing. And uh, frankly, that, that phrase just has uh, burned such a deep impression in my brain. I'll never hear, I'll never forget hearing that bus driver say that. Um, well, he was certainly a loss to me. 50,000 people spilled out into the streets that night. It had to be all of San Francisco, really. Um, it was a huge outpouring of um, sadness. And um, it kind of didn't hit me until a couple days later when I saw the caskets in City Hall Rotunda. And that was actually the first time that I reunited with Scott. And uh, we um, were on that upper balcony in City Hall. And we saw each other, and we started running towards each other, and it was like a slow motion scene from a movie. I'll never forget it. Um, and actually, City Hall, it has this resonance that I also just can never shake. Um, I actually came through the building once when I was a student in Oakland, and I had this very strong sense that some scene from my life would be played out in this building. I mean, it, you know, Anybody that walks into that rotunda certainly is, is stricken by its splendor, but there was something else uh, that day. <clears throat> we scattered Harvey's ashes to see uh, a close group of his friends. And uh, we, um, this is Galen and I, this is the first time I'm finally meeting the notorious Galen. And uh, that was the first day I met Joe Campbell. Um, it was an antique 50-foot schooner called the Lady Free, and the captain's name was Gay, which I thought was kind of neat. Uh, Harvey's ashes were wrapped into the uh, funny papers of the day, the Doonesbury comics, and Galen wrote uh, R.I.P. on a box in rhinestones. Um, this is the Gay Widows uh, on board that day. That's Scott Smith. Galen McKinley, Joe Campbell, and uh, Billy Wiegart. Doug Franks was also on, on board, but not up on the deck at that moment. <clears throat> I want to say a little word about the uh, White Knight riots when Dan White's verdict was delivered uh, the following May in 1979. Um, my pictures from that night are not very literal or graphic, uh, because I was really afraid. I was afraid of um, getting hurt. Uh, a couple times I, I felt <clears throat> bricks 
uh, passing by the side of my head, and I'll never forget the guttural sound of the cops as they moved in formation towards uh, the crowd. And then the crowd broke up and scattered, and all hell broke loose. Excuse me. I can remember uh, walking towards the Castro with my friends, and we could see, as far as the eye can see, in one lane of Market Street was uh, auxiliary cops from all of the suburbs. And so we took that as a, a bad sign and uh, did not go to the Castro where, um, you know, we now know that the cops were up there retaliating and uh, brutally beating patrons of the Elephant Walk Bar and smashing the windows. Um, I can remember uh, traversing my way back to my house in Haight-Ashbury through back roads so that I wouldn't be singled out and targeted and uh, it, it was um, you know it was like martial law it was really a frightening frightening night uh, Dan White served less than five years in jail and uh, he was convicted of manslaughter and he got out on good behavior believe that um, there was a countdown uh, on the corner of 17th and Castro Street uh, I believe Cleve Jones was uh, responsible for this street art and and then sort of towards the end of the countdown somebody crossed out the word uh, 85 days till Dan White is free and crossed out the word free and scrawled in the word dead. Um, there was a lot of anti-Dan White uh, graffiti at the time. There was an angry uh, demonstration earlier that afternoon and a street closing in the Castro that night where the crowd burnt an effigy of Dan White and Sister Boom Boom from the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence made a riveting speech about uh, the proposition that maybe somebody would get Dan White. That later became the opening monologue of a great play about the Dan White trial called Execution of Justice. Uh, Dan White committed suicide, so uh, he ended up being his own executioner. <clears throat> In 82, uh, Rob Epstein started a documentary on Harvey uh, and the No on Six campaign. Uh, it debuted in San Francisco at the Castro Theater on November 1st, 1984. Uh, there was, it was a standing ovation and there wasn't a dry eye in the house. Uh, it was completely disarming to hear Harvey's voice again. Um, the film won an Oscar in 1985 and it's probably the most effective uh, piece uh, devoted to continuing the legacy of Harvey Milk. Here's Scott proudly holding the Oscar um, at the party at Rob's house uh, the, the, on the Oscar night. And uh, Scott became the sole executor of Harvey's estate. And uh, it, um, you know, that Harvey named him as the sole executor, I think. Uh, was a great tribute to the the um, relationship between the two men. Uh, I've always felt that they were uh, inseparably soulmates, even though there was a lot of disparity in the latter campaigns. And uh, it went a great, you know, naming Scott as the executor. Uh, it it went a great way to heal the angst between the two men. Um, and Scott. Uh, remained a very outspoken and articulate spokesperson for Harvey's legacy. Um, I, I always saw his obsessiveness uh, immersing himself in the material as a way of coping. So in 83, uh, we rallied behind him and formed uh, the Harvey Milk Archives. We published three newsletters uh, and did several public exhibits and facilitated research and access for countless projects. Here's a little exhibit at the Castro Street Fair. We always tried to maintain a, a honor Harvey's sense of uh, humor. Uh, quite often we would evaluate uh, incoming projects on the merits uh, uh, based on whether Harvey would have loved it or not. So we would always catch ourselves saying, oh, Harvey would have loved it or Harvey would have hated it. Um, and any time we'd catch ourselves saying that, Scott and I would look at each other and realize how much we really missed him. Um, 
this was uh, one of the uh, projects that got a green light, and uh, certainly Harvey would have loved it. I mean, he would have howled. You know, the, the halo kind of it, says it all. And uh, even though he was somewhat anti-religious person, um, this poster was a fundraiser, and it was just such an odd piece that we just had to uh, support it. Um, my relationship with Scott centered on deconstructing his angst over the lack of diplomacy on the various projects that came in. Um, he rarely made any money from his vigilance, and uh, he hated thankless or expectant uh, projects. Uh, but he would nonetheless always find time uh, to, do, to do almost all of them, but I would hear about it. Um, here in 82 is the debut of Randy Schultz's book, um, The Mayor of Castor Street. Uh, the Harvey Milk Archives did an exhibit uh, in conjunction with uh, Randy's book signing party. Um, I'm the bleach hag on the right there. Uh, Scott wrote in my book that day, to Danny, one of Harvey's star pupils. The book actually didn't do that well, but the movie rights were sold, and uh, Scott and Randy became close allies, and Scott finally got properly compensated for his hard work. Um, Alva, his mom, would come visit quite often around Thanksgiving, and it would always prompt a gathering of the tribe. Here's Scott with his uh, lover at the time, Chuck Frucci, and Alva and Denton Smith. Um, probably the final triumph for Scott was the depiction of his character in uh, a same-sex kissing scene on stage for the Houston Grand Opera called Harvey Milk. This was unprecedented in opera history, and uh, ha uh, Harvey and Scott were big opera queens, so I think they both would have loved uh, being um, captured in, a, in an opera. Um, Scott and I played phone tag that week because uh, I wanted to get the report on the Houston experience. Um, and unfortunately, he went into the hospital, and um, I was the last person to see him consciousness because he, the next week, he died of HIV-related um, complications. Uh, and then he left his uh, estate to his next of kin, uh, Elvis Smith, who had the wisdom to uh, deed it to the collection here at the Hormel Center for Gay and Lesbian Studies. Um, I want to just close by saying, as we navigate and contemplate the issues before us, uh, we can find strength in examples of people like Harvey Milk and Scott Smith, who knew instinctively that pushing through hardship would lead to improved social conditions. At Harvey's memorial at the Opera House in 1978, someone fittingly quoted Victor Hugo, who said, of all the forces in the world, none are as powerful as a time, as none are as powerful as an idea whose time has come. Um, Harvey and Scott decided to get involved and believed in the power of the individual um, and their sense of hope quantified even before a bullet took Harvey down. But it's, rem it's important to remember that even though Harvey's murder increased our power, um, his accomplishments uh, occurred during his lifetime because he believed he could make a difference, and both men put that belief into action. Thank you. Mm-hmm.